All right, so today we are going to be talking about what happens when two waves try to occupy the same place at the same time. Okay, now if we were talking about, let's say, two cars trying to occupy the same space at the same time, how would that turn out? Badly, because cars are made of what? Yeah, matter, right? They're material. Two pieces of matter cannot technically occupy the same space at the same time. Why can waves do it? They're disturbance, right? They're energy, not matter. So they can occupy the same space at the same time. Here's the problem. They are traveling through matter. Okay, There is a medium that in which they travel. So if two waves are going to occupy the same space at the same time, and waves are energy, then something has to happen to the medium to reflect that there's that much energy there at that instant. That's what interference is. Okay, we've all dealt with interference. It's problematic, it's a pain in the neck, it makes you drop calls, okay, or whatever, okay, all that kind of stuff. Um, used to be a bigger problem, especially with cell phones and Wi Fi, okay, um, back when we only had like, you know, um, like the 2G stuff or um, our Wi Fi was like wireless C, okay, those could be interfered with by your microwave. Okay, like I remember I, I had like it was the it was March Madness was going on opening round and I try to watch as many games at the same time as possible. So I had my laptop, my iPad, my phone, the TV, and then a, like a second wireless TV and I had them all set up because I was working I was working in the kitchen and I wanted to be able to watch all the games at the same time. Uh, and then my my son comes in and throws something in the microwave and it was like crunch time in two games and all of a sudden the signal goes out. I'm like, ah, what are you doing? Turn the microwave off. And then I missed the end and it was a buzzer beater and it was a big upset and I was very angry. But, okay, that's it. Well, it's true. I was very angry. It's crunch time. What are you doing? Put something in the microwave during crunch time. Okay. Now, of course, you don't have to worry about that. Now, modern Wi-Fi doesn't work on the same uh, wavelength as a microwave does. Okay. So you don't get the interference. You don't drop. Your signal doesn't disappear when somebody fires up the microwave anymore. Okay. Absolutely. Way more. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the opening round, there's like four or five games going on at the same time. Right? Oh, yeah. As long as you get the right channel, you got enough channels. There's that game. One game is on every channel, man. Yeah. That, for, that first opening round weekend is crazy, man. You just sit in front of the TV. And don't move. And, you know, universities like the University of um, Maryland, Baltimore County, who nobody knows about, and they're 16 seed, and they, yeah, it's crazy. Okay. Anyway, back to this idea of interference. Okay. Um, so interference happens if two waves occupy the same space at the same time. If those waves are radio signals of some kind, and they occupy the same space, they change each other's shape. And then that's what causes us to have the symptoms of interference, okay? That is, our signal appears garbled or disappears completely or whatever, okay? Because these two things are making the medium in which they're traveling the wrong shape. And then our phone or whatever device we're using can't read it and it doesn't make sense. And so it just says no signal or it just quits, okay? So that's kind of what's going on with that. So we'll look at what that looks like here, okay? Most of the time, we can use interference to our advantage, and we do, okay? Sometimes we want to use what we call constructive interference. Constructive interference can cause an amplification of a signal or a wave without actually having to input any extra energy, okay? Destructive interference, on the other hand, can cause the wave to disappear completely, and we use that most often with sound, all right? Acoustic instruments use constructive interference to amplify the sounds that are produced by the instrument so that they are naturally louder but are unpowered all right if you're looking at like um, an electric guitar for example okay that's got a little pickup essentially a microphone that detects the vibrations of the strings and sends the electronic signal to an amplifier which then uses power to amplify the signal okay but an acoustic guitar you probably noticed has a certain shape as do all string instruments, okay? They have that kind of weird hourglass shape, okay? That hourglass shape is designed to channel and reflect the waves so that they interfere with each other in such a way that their amplitude actually increases. 
And if their amplitude increases, we hear a louder sound. Okay, so they resonate inside the, the cavity, the, the resonance cavity of the instrument. Okay, and then when they exit that, they are louder. Okay, because we've got a bunch of waves in there at the same time. All right, so that's kind of how that works. Now, we also have devices that muffle sound, okay, using destructive interference. Okay, like, for example, the muffler on your car provided you don't drive the redneck mobile that has them cut off, okay? Um, but what they're designed to do, okay, is to channel and, and reflect sound waves in such a way that they will interfere with each other destructively, okay? And reduce their amplitude so that they are quieter, right? And that's what the inside of your muffler is designed to do. It's got all kinds of baffles and reflective surfaces and things like that that basically kill the sound waves, okay? All right, so we're gonna look at what happens when two waves occupy the same space. We're gonna look at the two types of interference, constructive and destructive, and look at how that can be applied to practical uses. We've talked a little bit about that already, okay? So interference is caused by this phenomena, linear superposition, which is the really like fancy way of saying two waves are in the same space at the same time, okay? All right, so. Uh, there's a straightforward way to deal with situations in which two or more waves pass through each other, okay? So this on the left is showing what we call constructive interference, and on the left showing destructive interference. Now, as we can see, we've got these two pulses here on the left-hand diagram, okay? They each have the same amplitude. They're both, let's say, like up one, okay, or plus one. They would both have an amplitude of plus one. Everyone okay with that? Okay, so as they approach each other, they're carrying their energy through the slinky. When they reach the same point in the slinky, all that energy is now in one spot, okay? The law of conservation of energy says we can't create it, we can't destroy it, it has to still be there. So what happens to the amplitude of the slinky? Yeah, we add the amplitudes together, right? So now the wave that's in the slinky, at least for that instant, is showing all the energy of both waves. Now, here's the weird thing about waves, because again, they're not matter, they're just energy, they pass right through each other. Even though they interfere here, they pass right through each other and go on completely unaffected afterwards, right? So you can see that wave pulse A is over here now on the right-hand side when it started over here on the left, okay? That interference is only at the point where they overlap. Everyone good with that idea. So the principle of linear superposition sounds really complex, but it's super easy. When two waves occupy the same space, what do you do with their amplitudes? Add them together, then you're done. You'll have the resulting amplitude of the medium, okay? Same is true for destructive interference, okay? I've got wave pulse A, which is plus one. I've got wave pulse B, which is minus one, right? When they reach the same point on the spring, at least at that instant, they cancel each other. Okay? because their, their energies were opposite, okay? After that interference, they go on completely unaffected as they were before, right? This is why, like, back in the early days of cell phones, if you were in a spot that had, like, you know, kind of bad reception or whatever, you could, like, take a couple steps to one side and the reception got better, okay? Because all you had to do was get out of the spot where the waves were overlapping destructively and you were okay, right? Everyone kind of follow me there? All right. Um, the same is true still for sound. Okay. If you're in um, certain types of rooms, there will be spots where sound is louder and sound is quieter. Okay, And that's based on the wavelength of sound and the type of interference that occurs with it. And we're going to look at some examples of that today. All right. Now I'm going to show you this for real okay, with the slinkies. Rather than showing you the video, I'll show you for real with the slinkies here. Yes, noise canceling headphones work exactly like that. Okay, so on the outside of noise canceling headphones is a microphone. Okay, and it detects the sound waves and frequencies that are outside of it or wavelengths that are outside of it. And it produces exact opposites to those inside canceling the noise. Okay, that's active noise cancellation. Passive noise cancellation is just their, ins you know, they've got sound uh, muffling materials inside. They're basically just insulated. Yeah, but if you have active noise canceling, that's, actually using a sensor to produce the sounds that would actively create destructive interference. All right, so let's have a look at what this looks like for real. Okay, now I'm, I'm still gonna show you these videos here because we had we uh, slowed them down so you could kinda, so they were slow-mo.
Okay, so you could really see there for an instant that it was totally flat, right? And those are the reflected waves afterwards, and okay? they do the same thing there when they interfere, right? So the wave I made reflected off the other end and came back to me. Yes. Thought we didn't. Okay, yeah, I see, and he's going to go that way. So this is the problem with slow mo. Is now we're waiting in slow motion. Okay, so these ones are both the same direction. Right, and then they're right through each other afterwards. Yeah, there is something satisfying about that. All right. Okay, so um, in the di in the right hand diagram here, okay, what we it's what we just saw, okay, which is the constructive interference. So the two are, are coming towards each other. Their amplitudes add together. We get a higher wave, and then they travel on unaffected after that. Okay, destructive interference here on the left. The waves are opposite. They come in. We add their amplitudes, but that cancels out, and then the waves travel on unaffected afterwards. So the big thing here, guys, about the principle of linear superposition is, okay, that the waves Okay, or the medium will assume a shape that is the sum of the individual pulses or waves. Okay, and that includes when the waves are sound waves. Okay, the air assumes that shape. Okay, I know that sounds weird, but it does. Okay, the compressions and rarefactions add up and we get a louder sound okay? or a quieter sound if it's destructive interference. Okay, questions on how that works? Calvin? Yes, so it would be at one at one spot. Like, uh, so what we're gonna what I'm gonna show you in a little bit is if you have two speakers that are a little just uh, a ways apart and they're producing exactly the same tone in a room where the sound can't reflect off the walls, you'd be able to walk around that room and you'd stand in a quiet spot and then take a step over and it'd be really loud and then take a step back and it'd be quiet. Okay, there'll be areas within that room where the waves will always interfere constructively, always interfere destructively. Okay, with a car's muffler, we're getting things to interfere destructively, but we're also sending them through baffles to destroy the waves themselves. Okay, and actually just produce less sound. Right, so it's not true destructive interference, not like the noise canceling headphones are. Okay, um, so. This is the two opposite pulses, okay, so that's uh, destructive interference. So remember, okay, it's the adding together of individual pulses, okay, to form a resultant. That's the principle of linear superposition. Sorry, I'm not sure why they got cut off over there. Okay. So two kinds of interference. Constructive interference, that makes the, the amplitude bigger. Destructive interference, that makes the amplitude smaller. Okay, doesn't always cancel it out perfectly, but it certainly makes it smaller. Okay, please make sure you use the proper terms constructive and destructive. There's no such thing as deconstructive. Okay, but I see people write that all the time constructive and destructive. Okay, I might, depends what kind of mood I'm in. It's not the right word. All right, so if we have a series of waves, this still works, okay? We were just looking at individual pulses, but I have a series of waves, the same thing applies. All right, so if I've got uh, wave A and wave B here, okay? We can see that wave A or wave train A are the series of waves here and wave B are what we call in phase, okay? In phase means that when wave A is up, so is wave B. They have the same wavelength, they're traveling the same speed, they have the same frequency, so they're going to interfere with each other. Okay, um, And then as a result, they're going to get constructive interference. Okay, We've got like plus two and plus one, and our resulting amplitude is plus three, minus three, plus three, minus three as we go along. Everyone okay with that? Okay. Opposite over here. Okay, These waves, even though they have the same wavelength and the same frequency and are traveling at the same speed, are completely out of phase. That is, when one is up, the other is down. Okay, that means they're going to interfere destructively with each other. Okay, so plus two and minus one, and we get a smaller amplitude. 
Okay, and we get a decreased amplitude, not totally canceled, but smaller. Okay. All right. So this is what I was talking about with the sound waves. Okay, if I can put you in um, what we call an anechoic chamber, okay, which is a room whose walls will not reflect sound, okay, so not this room. Um, then there'll be no reflections of sound off the walls, and all you will hear is the original sounds produced by the speakers. If the speakers are just making a tone, okay, so the same frequency of sound all the time, there would be spots in the room where I would stand where I would hear nothing. And then I'd take a step over, and I would it would be really loud, okay? Anywhere in between, and I would hear, like, as I moved from the spot where it's, there's no sound to the spot where there's a loud sound, I would hear a gradual increase. Okay, in the amplitude of the sound. And that's simply because waves are arriving either in phase or out of phase at those positions based on the number of wavelengths they've traveled to get there. Okay? Because the sound is coming from two sources, some of the waves have to travel farther than the others. Okay? If I'm closer to one speaker than the other, then the waves from one speaker travel further than the waves from the other. If the waves from one speaker travel two wavelengths and the other ones travel two and a half, then they're arriving in phase or out of phase? Out of phase, right? Because they're one's traveling a half a wavelength further, which means it's arriving as a trough, and the other one's arriving as a crest. And so they'd be out of phase. Okay. If I stand in another spot where I'm three wavelengths from one speaker and two wavelengths from the other, I'll hear. No, I'll hear a louder sound. Because now they've traveled a full wavelength difference. So they're still arriving crest to crest and trough to trough. That's what I'm going to show you here. Okay. So with this diagram here on the left, okay, this person is three meters from both speakers. So he's equidistant from both speakers. All right. The wavelength of this sound, just for argument's sake, is one meter. So here's the first wavelength, here's the second wavelength, here's the third wavelength. Okay. So it's arriving as a crest. We'll say the solid lines are crests and the um other ones, well, it says compression and rarefactions because it's sound, okay? And then here, I've got a crest, a crest, or a compression, a compression, a compression. So they're arriving compression to compression, and that's going to interfere constructively, and I'll hear a loud sound, okay? Everybody all right with that? If I back this speaker up a half a meter, what will I hear? Nothing. Because now this will travel three and a half wavelengths, and it'll be a rarefaction when it gets here, not a compression. Okay, and they'll, they'll interfere or destructively, all right? So if I've got this situation, okay, here, each one of these solid lines will say is a compression, okay? If I stand right here, I hear loud or quiet? Loud, it's compression to compression, right? Solid line to solid line, okay? So I would hear a loud sound. The waves from this speaker have traveled one, two wavelengths. The ones from this one have only traveled one, okay? What if I stand here? It'll be quiet, okay? I'm standing in a spot where I've got a compression from speaker A, but I'm in between them for speaker B, which means I'm at a rarefaction from B, okay? So there, they're going to interfere destructively, and I'll hear nothing, all right? So there'd be positions around the room where I could stand where it'd be loud, and positions around the room where I could stand where it'd be quiet. Okay, as long as I was in an anechoic chamber, which looks like something from a horror movie. It, like if you ever stand in a real anechoic chamber, it looks like you're standing inside a meat grinder. Okay, because the walls have to have all these random shapes and points so that they, the reflections don't all come back off a flat surface. Okay, and that's how it, it reduces the echoes okay, that you get off of the walls by having surfaces that are either both are they're actually both non-reflective and they reflect things at odd random angles so that they can't come back at the same time. So like you're hearing what they're doing, different posture, different Yes, it is. Yeah. I don't have a picture of it. Okay, what is it called? An anechoic chamber. So A N and then echo ic. Yeah. All right. Um, so in this case here, what we're looking at is constructive interference, okay? What determines whether you hear a loud sound or a quiet sound is the number of wavelengths traveled from each source, okay? If the difference in wavelengths is a whole number, then you get constructive interference. If the difference in wavelengths is a half, one and a half, two and a half, five and a half, 20 and a half, okay, then you're going to get 
destructive interference, okay? Because one will have traveled a half a wavelength further than the other, and they will arrive out of phase. One's a trough and one's a crest, okay? Yes, that's what it looks like. Looks like you're inside a meat grinder, okay? It's weird too, because if you talk to yourself, well, you hear it, but you only hear it like inside your head. Yeah, that's freaky. Yeah. Of course, if you're talking to yourself, you kind of already have some issues probably, but you know. Okay, it's not insane to talk to yourself. It's insane if you talk back. Okay. That's when it gets crazy. Okay, that's where we have to draw the line. You can talk to yourself, but if you start talking back, start arguing with yourself, that might, yeah, that might be a sign of something wrong. Okay. Okay. So we said here just a minute ago, if I back one of these speakers up a half a meter, I change the situation. Now, okay, the the waves from this speaker are now traveling three and a half wavelengths, whereas the ones from the other speaker are still traveling three wavelengths. So now they're arriving out of phase, rarefaction to compression. And so we don't hear anything at that point. That would be the equivalent of standing um, here. Okay, I'm standing, sorry, not there, here. Okay, standing right here. Okay, I'm three wavelengths from that speaker, but I'm one, two, three and a half from this speaker. Okay, so now I hear a quiet sound. Okay, I'm getting destructive interference at that point. Okay, so they're exactly out of phase or 180 degrees out of phase. Okay, something like that. All right, questions on how that works? Everybody's all right with that. So if you are like designing and installing home theater packages, okay, this is something that you usually have to consider. All right, there are uh, physical ways to cause this constructive and destructive interference to occur where the people are going to sit. Okay, and there are electronic ways to make sure. Okay, um, anybody ever like fool around with their home theater receiver? Okay, one of the settings in your home theater receiver generally is called delay. Okay, and delay will, exactly as it, sound, as it would imply, delay certain frequencies from being produced when they're supposed to be. That will allow them to um, arrive at the seating position in phase, even though if they were produced at the same time from the other two speakers, they would, be, they would interfere destructively. So it delays it just a fraction of a second to make sure that essentially all wavelengths of sound are going to arrive at the listener in phase. Okay, now you kind of really have to do a lot of measuring to know which frequencies you have to mess with. Okay, um, so it's usually something that a professional would do or install, okay, when they're putting it together. It's something that they definitely do in a movie theater, okay, where they've got multiple speakers, multiple sound sources, things like that, in order to make sure that no, there's not a bad seat, okay, in the house. Now, where's the best seat in a movie theater? Middle. Yeah, middle of the theater from the sides and front to back, okay? That is where the sound is generally going to focus best, okay? That's usually why in some theaters that have the fancy seating, that's where the fancy seating is, like if they got the couch, okay? There's some of them that have that, okay? Um, yeah, okay, that's where it'll be. The best seats are always in the middle. If you're closer to one side or the other, it's harder for that timing to work well. You're gonna hear dominant sound from one side or the other. All right. Okay, so this is what we were kind of what I was kind of talking about with you there. If I was designing like, you know, putting together somebody's home theater, I would put their couch right here. Okay, because I'm going to get constructive interference at that point. I would not put it here because this would be a point of destructive interference. So I put their couch or with their seating, okay, in a spot where I'm generally going to get constructive interference. Again, that's dependent on what frequencies of sounds are being produced. That's why they have to also electronically delay some frequencies. Right. So the big thing here, guys, is that it's the difference in the number of wavelengths traveled that determines whether you hear a loud or quiet sound. Okay, At this point here, I hear a loud sound because I've traveled two wavelengths from one speaker and three wavelengths from the other. The difference is one whole wavelength. Okay, At this position here, I have traveled two and a half wavelengths from one speaker, three from the other. The difference is half a wavelength. I'm out of phase, I hear nothing at that position. Okay, so it's the difference in the number of wavelengths. Okay. 
okay? If the difference is an integer, okay, then we get constructive, okay? If it's a half integer, okay, then we get destructive interference, okay? That's the big thing we gotta know for this. I just went and underlined everything. I feel like I'm back in first year university. Everything was important. I highlighted it all. Yeah. Okay, so here's the kind of problem that we could encounter on a test, a problem solving problem to do with interference. Okay. Um, so let's just, uh, I'm just gonna move this stuff down and we'll. work it out on our own here. Okay, so um, here's what we've got. We've got two loudspeakers and they are 3.20 meters apart, okay? The listener is 2.4 meters directly in front of speaker B. So this is B and this is A. All right, um, the speakers are playing identical 214 Hertz tones. Okay, and the speed of sound in the room is 343 meters per second. Right? I want to hear, I want to determine whether this person hears a loud sound or a quiet sound. What determines that is the number of wavelengths from each speaker. What do I not know right now? Wavelength, can I find it? Yes. Okay, so let's do that first. All right, we're going to use V equals F times lambda. Okay, so lambda will equal V over F. 343 divided by 214, okay? Um, that should give us 1.6, right? Okay, so my wavelength is 1.6 meters. So what I need to determine is how many wavelengths is it from this speaker to the person and how many wavelengths is it from this speaker to the person? Right now, I don't know how far it is from A to the person. How will I find that? Yeah, just use Pythagorean theorem, okay? So... 2.4 squared plus 3.2 squared. Oh, okay, that's nice. So that side's exactly four meters. Okay. One wave is 1.6 meters long. How do I determine how many waves there are? Right, divide by them. I take that distance, four meters, and I divide by 1.6. That will tell me how many waves there are between okay, um, the speaker and the person. All right, so four divided by 1.6, two and a half waves. All right, so essentially then what I've got going on here is, so there's one wave, there's two waves, and there's the half a wave, okay? Two and a half wavelengths. All right, got to do the same thing here, okay? 2.4 divided by 1.6 should be 1.5. Yeah, okay, so there's one and a half wavelengths coming from speaker B. So there's one wavelength and a half. Are they coming in in phase? Yes. yes. This person hears a loud sound, okay? The way I would do that mathematically is I would just go 2.5 wavelengths minus 1.5 wavelengths is one wavelength. That's constructive interference, okay? The difference is a whole wave. Yes. Yeah, it wouldn't be as high a quality or as loud. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense, everybody? What if that number had come out to 10 wavelengths? Would it still be constructive interference? Yes. yes. As long as it's an integer difference, okay, uh, you're going to hear a loud sound. Now, obviously, there's a point where that kind of breaks down because sound you know, gets quieter the further away you get from something. I mean, if the difference in travel is 150 wavelengths, you're probably not hearing it very well, okay? Just because it had to travel so far. All right, so most of the time it's gonna be small distances like this. There has never been a unit exam that did not have a question like this on it. There never will be. There'll always be one like this. The other way that I will test this on a unit exam is to give you a diagram, something like this. Except it would be on like graph paper so you could see the, the amplitudes or actually measure them. So I would give you that 
and the question would say, draw the resulting waveform and indicate whether this is constructive or destructive interference. Okay, could you do that? Okay, what kind of interference is going on here? Constructive. constructive. These waves are in phase. When one is up, the other is up. They have the same wavelength. All right, what's the resulting wave going to look like? like right. Add those it's add those together. Exactly. So it'll look something like this. Okay, except obviously on a test, I would have a graph paper background so that you could make it exactly the right heights. Okay, so you'd know this one was plus three and this one was plus two or whatever. Okay, making sense? Is that a pretty easy question? Yeah. Yep, and that's all I did here, right? Is I just added, well, roughly added them together. Yeah. Okay, so that's two things that you would see definitely on a unit exam. A question like this, okay, where you're going to have to figure out whether it's loud or quiet based on universal wave equation. Okay, had to use that. Okay, and uh, this principle of linear superposition. Okay, a little bit of Pythagorean theorem, nothing difficult. Okay, but okay, that's definitely something that you would see. All right. Um, so that's all I have on interference, but I have a couple of things I want you guys to work on here to do with that. So just give me one sec. Okay, so for this one here, okay, uh, they hear a 400 hertz sound. Okay, so we know what F is, 400 hertz. Okay, it's traveling at 340 meters per second. Okay, they're standing 6.8 meters in front of one speaker. Okay, and the speakers are 6.42 meters apart. Okay, so basically the same as the last question. I need to know how far this is. So that's the first thing I've got to calculate. Okay, so that side's 9.352 meters. Okay, and I need to calculate the wavelength as well. All right, so wavelength will be 340 divided by 400, so we're looking at a wavelength of under a meter this time. Okay, so 0.85 is our wavelength. Okay, um, so now that I've got those, now I can calculate how many wavelengths there are on this side and how many wavelengths there are on that side. Okay, so we'll take our 9.3518 one, two, six, five, nine, and divide that by uh, 0.85. And so we're looking at 11 wavelengths on this side. Okay, same thing on this side, 6.8 divided by 0.85. All right, so we're looking at eight wavelengths on this side. Loud or quiet? Loud. Difference is three full wavelengths. Therefore, they're going to arrive in phase okay, and interfere constructively at that point. All right. Okay, on Monday, we will be looking at uh, wave behavior at a boundary. Okay, That'll, we'll be looking at that for probably two days or so. Okay, um, And then we're moving on uh, to standing waves and stuff like that from there. All right, guys, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be done before you know it. Okay, so make sure that you're starting your final exam kind of preparation. Do a question a night from a different unit and see how that goes.